And uh, when you hear students with uh, such consciousness on food, you feel better about your food future for sure. And uh, now we shall have an address on food and climate change by Miss Prachi Shivankar. Over to you. Hi everyone. I don't know how to follow this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm, my name is Prachi Shivankar. I'm the founder of Cool the Globe. Um, it's a citizen-led app for climate action. And um, Pavan sir, thank you so much for calling me here, first of all. Not only for calling me, but also for being a great source of inspiration and a mentor to all of us young kids. I think everybody here who knows Pavan sir knows that he's the youngest at heart in all the young kids who are here. Um, <laughs> I want to start by telling all of you about why I'm here um, and why I do the work that I do. Um, I think all of you gave a presentation earlier, you're about 16. Um, a bit, I was, when I was a bit older than you, when I was about 18, I went on a quest to figure out how I could make a difference to my career. So it was during this time that I remember doing a Google search. Um, can I get a slide? You, uh, if you go to the next slide. So I remember doing a Google search on what is the biggest problem in the world right now. I was surprised to see that global scientists, organizations, world leaders were talking about how climate change is the most pressing challenge in front of us today. So I started looking, reading up more about climate change. I started reading up about the effects of climate change. Um, I read up about all of this, about extreme weather events, flooding, wildfires, sea level rise, coastal erosion, loss of biodiversity, the list was endless. I read all of this and then I asked myself a question that I want to ask all of you also. Do you care about climate change? Give me a show of hands. <laughs> of course all of you do. <laughs> but I wasn't as aware as you were when I asked myself this question. I remember giving it a thought, having a moment of honesty. And I said, I don't think I care enough about this. Climate change seemed like this larger than life problem beyond my control. So I spent the next four months working on something that I did care about. I traveled across Maharashtra trying to map out the journey of how my food comes to my plate. My plate. During this time, um, I met thousands of farmers across small towns and villages in Maharashtra. Um, and it was then that I met an old farmer who taught me more about climate change than any global expert ever did. He told me, I can't afford to keep farming anymore. The weather has become too unreliable. And when I can't afford to grow food, there are a thousand people behind me who can't afford to buy food. So climate change means more and more people will go hungry. Over the next year, I traveled across India. And I kept meeting more and more people who were the voices and the faces behind this catastrophic effects of climate change. They made me realize that climate change is not just about these big words that we read in reports. It is affecting our health, it's affecting our homes, it's affecting our livelihoods, our families, and most importantly, it is impacting our food. Food and climate change are tied very closely together. It was during this time that I realized that we cannot fight climate change without changing our food systems, and we cannot achieve food security without fighting climate change. In 2020, global food systems produce 16 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions. That is one third of all global emissions across industries. Where are these emissions coming from? Let's look at the life cycle of our food to understand this. Um, um, more than half of all greenhouse gas emissions from food are produced at its birthplace, within the farm gate. And much of these emissions are nitrous oxide and methane, which is a lot more lethal than carbon dioxide. Um, then a 
small portion of our food goes to factories. And in pre- and post-production processes contribute to about one-third of all food-related greenhouse gas emissions. For most of us, our food actually travels a lot more than we do. Um, globe, and we call it food miles, just like flight miles. Uh, and global food miles lead to about 3 mil billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions every year. That's about 20% of all food-related greenhouse gas emissions. And in fact, for fruits and vegetables, their food miles, the travel that fruits and vegetables have to do, produces mo two times more emissions than even their production. And the sad reality is that even after all of this, a big portion of our food is never even consumed. Food waste, reducing food waste, has the potential to save about 6 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions every year. But this can only happen through behavioral change and awareness. If the link between food and climate change is worrying to you, to me, it seems like a ray of hope. Because I can't change the decisions of countries, world leaders, and industries, but I can change the way I eat my food. And my food choices have the power to transform the food system. Um, in, at COP26, Prime Minister Narendra Modi launched an initiative called Mission Life, Lifestyle Change for Environment, to show that in the face of climate change, our words matter. Our food choices matter, and our actions matter. And that's why I built Cool the Globe, um, a citizen-led app for climate action. On Cool the Globe app, people like you and I can reduce their greenhouse gas emissions to a target across areas like travel, uh, usage of appliances, materials, energy saving, waste segregation, and of course, food choices. So people record their climate actions on the app and track the greenhouse gas emissions they're saving by doing this. Um, I launched, um, let me give you an example. So um, I remember a young boy um, called me up and said that I want to be a part of your mission. I want to help fight climate change too. I love chicken, but um, to become more sustainable, I'm going to cut down on eating meat for the next three months. And by doing this, he recorded saving 20 kg of greenhouse gas emissions on the app. On the other hand, an old woman called me and said that um, uh, for the past 40 years, she had been composting her food waste in her own house. Uh, she recorded in the, uh, it on the app and realized that she had been saving 2 kg of greenhouse gas emissions every month by doing this. I started this app from the dorm room of my college. And today, um, we have... Uh, today we have citizens like you and I from over 110 countries joining in. 45,000 people came together on the app <laughs> and recorded saving over 2.5 million kg of greenhouse gas emissions simply by making lifestyle changes for the environment. And during the course of this, I saw time and again young people taking a lead in this mission. Behavioral change is the most effective at an early age. And that's why, under the leadership of Pavan Sir, Food Future Foundation and Cool the Globe launched an initiative called My School Climate Club, a student-led movement to mobilize citizens to start making lifestyle changes for the environment. One third of all climate actions we recommend to students under this are food-related. I've seen that when a child makes a sustainable change in his life, he takes it first to his house and then to his community. One school, one child, and one action can inspire 10 others and create a wildfire of change. And that's why, with Food Future Foundation and Cool the Globe, we are on a mission to transform food systems and fight climate change through schools and through the power of students. And at the launch of this coalition, through the launch of this coalition, you are all now a part of this mission too. So join us and let's do this together. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Prashi. Absolutely. I mean, at this age, uh, mostly we, we are... Uh, preoccupied with uh, having fun uh, and uh, just, you know, 
Uh, yes, she's having fun. I mean, she feels this is this is uh, her fun. Uh, mostly, uh, I was saying, giving an example of the average uh, uh, teenage or uh, early adolescent is we are uh, worried about more about uh, when's the next party happening. <laughs> but uh, you have uh, really made this uh, climate change uh, issue the you know the cool topic, cooling the globe. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I think uh, there are lots of amazing insights that are coming out in each presentation. And for now, uh, we have uh, a very special audio visual for you all. This is a short film on this coalition, on uh, the COP uh, event that we are here for. And this film will tell us about the beginning, the whys, and the steps that have been taken during this coalition. So I would like to present to you the Coalition Shot Film. multitude of challenges. These challenges are deeply interwoven and complex, ranging from production to consumption. While the scope and scale of these challenges are vast, they also offer us a unique opportunity for innovative and holistic solutions. We need to apply these solutions to transform our food systems and create a food secure, safe, healthy and sustainable world. In June 2021, the Coalition for Food Systems Transformation in India, COFTI, was conceived in a meeting convened by the Food Future Foundation, coinciding with the UN Food Systems Summit. The India Food System Vision Report 2030 was developed by Food Future Foundation in partnership with GIZ and CII FACE to guide its objectives and strategies. In June 2023, with the support of German cooperation, the coalition took a definitive shape during a consultation workshop. Experts converged to share their knowledge, vision and hopes on a shared direction for the future of food systems in India. The coalition was further strengthened in its first multi-stakeholder workshop held in New Delhi in October 2023. It was attended by over 100 experts and joined by 400 plus online participants. The workshop brought forward diverse perspectives and helped ground the coalition's vision in practical solutions. Seven strategic entry points were identified as potential catalysts for instigating meaningful change. The seven entry points have been beautifully depicted through the coalition logo. It represents the fragile interconnectivity of our food system akin to the butterfly effect. Diets and consumption. Children are very, very important in this conversation because the adults have already formed their food habits. In a country like India where the population is the biggest dividend that we have, children occupy 20%. It's a great investment for future. Agroecology and smallholding farmers. Agriculture is one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. It's also responsible for a lot of water pollution, water stress. 
but it gives livelihood to many people and it provides us nutrition. So if we fix agriculture based on agroecological principles, there is a potential to solve many of these problems at once. Food businesses. How is it that this coalition uh, can enable food manufacturers to bring more good food products to their customers? We're putting together a very objective um, scientific metric, right? Uh, through the Good Food Company certification that allows us to identify, recognize, and acknowledge companies who are doing work in this space. Food waste and loss. India is on an average in the globe's the second position when it comes to food production. One side we are a, a very good food producing economy, and the other side there are same people in India who are starving for food and they are not getting proper food, nutritious food. Food environments. With the advent of uh, FSSAI, the enforcement, and with FOSTAG, the training uh, and certification happening in Pushyapi, the whole Pushyapi landscape is beautifully improved. There are gaps because uh, uh, it is still difficult to convince the roadside vendors, it is still difficult to convince the small retailers, small service providers. But then just slowly the society is realizing that food safety is as important as food taste. Policy and institutions. The most important role for the government is to see that uh, the food system evolves in a way that is good both for people and planet. Aligning, you know, different mandates of different agencies and ministries in the government is topmost priority in bringing about food system change. Food system leaderships. In the industry we have a whole bunch of subject matter experts in different areas. How do we bring that so that we are building leaders of tomorrow who are solving problems not just of today but of tomorrow? And that is going to be around nutrition, sustainability, um, whether sustainability means sustainable packaging, it means managing food waste. Through these entry points, the coalition will spearhead collective efforts by its stakeholders with a mission of ensuring people-centric food systems transformation through collaborative leadership, concrete action, inclusivity, and innovative strategies that prioritize health environment and equality. There is nothing comparable in India so far. So it will be the first food system coalition. I think that it's a very promising initiative. These kind of coalitions can become the voice of change. Let's together make this nation more healthier. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that was a very, very uh, a thoughtful uh, and uh, informative short video there. There is a quotation that says that uh, you cannot think well, love well, sleep well if you do not eat well. So all of our wellness, our very existence depends on eating well and uh, we are all here gathered, not just worried about us eating well, but worried about and concerned about and sharing uh, our wisdom about uh, the whole nation eating well. And uh, on this, uh, we have now the next presentation because everything begins with literacy, education. That's what we are going to be talking about next. This is a presentation on food literacy in schools by the Food Future Foundation team. And for this, I will be inviting on stage Ms. Aditi Mehrotra, co-founder of uh, Arnie's Fit Kids and advisor at uh, Food Future Foundation. 
Ms. Archana Jain, Head Department of Human Development at SVT College of Home, and Home Science, SNDT University, Mumbai, and Ria Gaba, Nutritionist and Senior Program Executive at Food Future Foundation. Please welcome our team for this presentation on food literacy. Thank you, Swati. Um, I'm truly delighted uh, that you've taken our butterfly coalition way too seriously and very enthusiastically that I can see it on your sari as well. So one, we have the, um, you know, that uh, installation so beautifully done by the students of Lotus High International School Gurugram. And here is you. I wish I would have also dug out some sari with butterflies. And in fact, we've had too many butterflies. You know, I got a call from one uh, student saying that even on the way, on the roads, and even in my dreams, I'm just looking and, you know, dreaming of butterflies. <laughs> okay, so I'm delighted to welcome you all on behalf of Food Future Foundation to our presentation on a subject that holds the power to transform our lives, our communities, and our future. So this is Food Literacy. Uh, you just wit witnessed a remarkable display of awareness um, by the students and that is a true testament to the youth voice and um, it is so powerful and it is so endearing to know that they are part of our vision. This is the shared vision and now finally we've got youth centre stage. Um, we will also be uh, presenting to you uh, just the uh, transformation and the development that uh, has happened in the last one year in terms of our uh, food literacy curriculum development. Uh, aligning food literacy education with SDG 4 focuses on ensuring quality education for all which is so critical because it recognizes the profound impact that education, particularly food literacy, can have on individuals and communities. This way, we will be able to keep pace with the evolving food landscape. Observing the statistics, it becomes evident that one out of every two adolescent experiences a deficiency in at least two of the six essential micronutrients. And uh, we have used the research methods, we've used sources of information, and it has become rather crucial for designing an effective educational program and intervention to address the gaps. So we sought input from experts in the field of nutrition, education and child development. Their insights and recommendations have helped shape the curriculum to ensure it was evidence-based and effective. And we've also tried to make it as much as we could um, age-appropriate. Uh, we tried doing some kind of a gap analysis, but my recent conversation with Pavan sir said that absence of an existing food curriculum uh, to analyze the gap created uh, a unique situation where we established our uh, curriculum as the benchmark. And based on the uh, needs assessment, we established clear objectives for the curriculum with help of again domain experts and ladies and gentlemen let me tell you from all around India. Now um, I would like to call uh, Ria but before that quickly I'll share that before the full implementation we have already been piloting the curriculum in con controlled environments of course in schools to assess its effectiveness and identify any necessary improvements. We have added stakeholder engagements and this is a development. Let me just point it out to you that um, various stakeholders include teachers, parents, which is really obvious, but here we have the students, which you just saw, to gather diverse perspectives and ensure the curriculum met the needs and expectations of all involved parties. Again and again, I'm saying that children are center stage. So we developed assessment tools to measure students' progress, which I will be taking up a little later. So let me invite Ria, who has been passionately working with Sunetra Rode at the league and uh, everyone else in the team since its inception to explain the, uh, the progression of the curriculum. Over to you, Ria. Thank you very much, Aditi Ma'am. 
Ma'am. So we began working on the curriculum, the framework of the food literacy curriculum almost one year back. And today it's more comprehensive and holistic than it was ever was. And it has thoughtfully designed eight foundational themes. This curriculum is aligned with NCF, that is the National Curriculum Framework for School Education 2023. And this is under the National Education Policy. As part of this curriculum, we have a school handbook and a student's workbook of, for grades nursery to grade 8 and a comprehensive teacher's manual. So a child-centric pedagogy incorporates five key elements for interactive learning. We have in-class in -class activities to keep students actively engaged, dedicated food lab for practical experiences, outdoor activities for real-world exposure, at-home assignments that involve parents in learning, and digital tools to enhance the impact. We have the habit trackers for continuous reinforcement. Through children, this approach extends learning to the families and the societies promoting behavior change. We are also introducing an innovative concept here, the food lab. Just as there are physics lab and bio lab, then why not the food lab? This unique educational space brings the curriculum to life, offering students a deeper understanding of what truly constitutes good food. Here, students just don't uh, learn about the concepts, they experience them hands-on. We employ various creative tools here, like the floor games you can see on the screen, wall mounts, game boards, and much more to facilitate practical learning experiences, making food education engaging and tangible. Yes. So this is the architectural representation of the food lab, and it depicts a theme-based concept, corners. Each theme is assigned to specific sections or areas within the lab. Now the roadmap for universalizing uh, the food literacy is built on these essential pillars. We have to empower the educators with the knowledge and skills to deliver the food literacy effectively, then transforming school food environments to promote healthy eating, and advocating for a nationwide effort to prioritize food literacy for every child. In conclusion, integrating food literacy into the existing school curriculum is essential to bring about a dietary shift towards safe, nutritious, and sustainable food. Thank you all for your kind attention. Now, I would like to invite Ms. Archana Jain to discuss the teacher's training online certification course. Thank you so much. I'm sure that uh, you have seen such a wonderful work that the uh, children showed today from the valley, um, Lotus, Lotus Valley. And I'm sure you'll all agree that every child in India deserves this kind of an input and every child should be like this. So how do you reach out to this entire world, the, at least not the world, and at least our, our country? So for this, I was assigned the, the task of making this wonderful course something that can reach out to all the teachers, parents, or whoever is interested, any stakeholder who is interested, but it has to be across India, pan-India. And that's the reason why we thought that we, it has to be something which is feasible and it is something that has to be doable. So with that in mind, with that in mind, I designed this course. So the course is an online course, uh, it can be blended, or it can be uh, uh, done online also. Uh, the course is at three levels, certification, advanced certification and diploma. So the certificate course is just a 30 hour course, anyone can do it and it will cover the age from nursery to second standard. Now if someone is finding it interesting, they can go to the second level, do another 30 hours and then they get an advanced certificate and they get trained up to primary school that is third to fifth standard. So they have from then they are trained to work with children from nursery to fifth class. And the advanced diploma is taking them to the next level that is six to eight plus 60 hours. So within a span of 90 and 120 hours, you get a certificate and a totally qualified and trained to carry out the food literacy program in schools. This is easier said than done. And that is the reason why I thought of the, how is this program going to be 
share to the teachers? How do you enable the teachers to do this course? So with that in mind, uh, we thought that uh, the program should have uh, information literacy, food literacy information along with it a manual with a detailed teaching plan. Exactly what the methodology should be. Every teacher is not trained on the methodologies that can be working. So if there is a manual which tells them exactly what the lesson plan is, what is the game you are going to do, how are you going to start the program, what are the questions you are going to ask. But even if I do that, who is going to make the aids? Who is going to uh, make the posters? So we thought if we make the posters and we give the audio visual material along with the program. So now all the teacher has, has to do is pick the manual, take the printout of the audio visual aids and conduct the program. That makes it feasible. And that is the reason why we have uh, visualized the training program in such a manner that we give the entire package. So anyone who takes this training has the entire toolkit with her. And because it is online, anyone can do it. Some of the methodologies that this is something which we have been doing in our school. And so this is a farmer's uh, agriculture that we had done. So this is something and you can see how involved the children are, how we use uh, experiential learning, visits, theme setups for making it fun for the children and learning and they never forget this because it is something which they have done experiential, hands-on, participative learning. So that's how the uh, toolkit and the audio version of the material will be for the children. So thank you and I think that's it from my side. Yeah. Now uh, once we have done the program, how do we know that it is effective? Anything that you start has to be assessed. So we have this matrix of evaluation which has been designed by our college and uh, it is looking at, of course, first the process indicators. How many schools, how many children, how many teachers were involved and then along with that the change. How effective was it? Was there a change in the children's behavior? Was there a change in the school environment? Was there a change in the parental attitude and understanding of food literacy? So the evaluation and this evaluation is uh, done by a uh, well-established standardized tool uh, prepared by Dr. Moitre under the guidance of Dr. Madan from our college and it's called as the CAPES, uh, Cape Kids tool uh, which is for the children. Then there is a fresh queue which is for the school environment and there is a parent NK queue tool which is for the parents. This is the tool which is already standardized, stabilized, used in our uh, uh, college and has been also seeked by other colleges and institutions. So that's the entire program, the training with the tool, with the material, everything and then the evaluation. So we are looking forward to unfolding this as soon as possible. Thank you so much. You. I'll quickly run you through the pilots that we've conducted in Rajasthan. Uh, across 20 schools covering over 6,000 uh, students and another pilot that we are doing conducting at uh, Lotus Valley International School Gurugram and we've engaged them as a key stakeholder and pioneer to review the curriculum within a food lab format and here are the results of the midline survey after rolling out the curriculum the baseline was conducted in the schools 20 schools of Rajasthan in August September 2022 and the midline was conducted in February, March 2023. We have the dashboard right here. I only want to highlight a few things that there was a 2.3 percentage <laughs> decrease in uh, the malnourished children. And this includes children who were thin, severely thin, obese and overweight. And I was myself there, um, you know, in the schools. I used to go and uh, spend a little time while the classes, food literacy classes were on. And uh, I would ask them that, uh, kya maza aata is class mein kya acha lagta hai? So I would get collective answers such as, uh, Ganit badi kachin hai, or uh, Hindi mein uh, matrae ka dhyan rakna padta hai, Angrezi mein spelling zyaad karni padti hai, par food literacy mein bina preparation ke koi homework nahi hum aake, sirf baate karte hai, uh, khani peene ki. So this is the positive undertone that we are wanting uh, amongst the children. Then uh, another thing that we noticed in terms of hygiene, um, children washing their hands with soap and water, the percentage had increased soon after our two months, three months intervention, which was very promising. <laughs> and 74.6% of the school children reported increasing their consumption of vegetables, 
and 62% uh, actually started eating uh, fruits. Consumption of milk also went up. And uh, last, the last slide is very, very promising. We had almost 89.93% of school children who had the ability to take charge of their nutrition after engaging with food literacy curriculum. And in the end, I'd just like to say that we are all committed to ongoing evaluation and updates, allowing us to adapt to the curriculum as needed to keep it very, very relevant and effective. And uh, food literacy is a lifelong journey, we all know. And food eating is a behavior, it's a learned behavior. So uh, I would just like to thank you and I encourage you to continue the conversation about food literacy, keep it going. Let's work together to create a world where everyone has the knowledge and skills to make nourishing and sustainable food choices. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Aditi. And congratulations. I think uh, the achievements that you have uh, accomplished with this program are just wonderful. 2.3% decrease in malnutrition. 61% uh, increase in vegetable intake, increase in fruit intake by kids. And I think we always, like, uh, like especially uh, as a person of this generation, we used to think, you know, why don't we, why don't we learn life skills in school? Uh, we always uh, learn the subjects and everything. But what about the life skills? And I think this is the first time. This is the change happening right in front of us. History in the making, everyone. Huge round of applause. And with that, I would like to invite for our next address, Director, Corporate Affairs, Asia, Middle East and Africa, Tetra Pak, on Food Systems Transition. Please welcome our guest, uh, Mr. Feru Gurtas. Thank you. Thank you so much. It'll be quite difficult for me to present a corporate pitch after all these lively presentations, and especially from the schools. Uh, but let me uh, first start introducing myself. My name is Ferruk Gurtash. I'm the Corporate Affairs Director for Asia, Middle East and Africa regions. I have a team here in India that's working with our stakeholders here. And today, what I would like to really present to you is first an introduction of Tetra Pak, and then talk about how we as a corporation representing a part of the food systems industry uh, plan to contribute to the transition of first, uh, food systems. So first on Tetra Pak, uh, I'm sure you know Tetra Pak is a company that's doing packaging, especially on liquids. So this is one of our packages. Uh, but also there's another one here, that's plastic. So first question, uh, some of the presenters also did a survey. Which one do you think is more sustainable? Who says this one? Which one is more sustainable? How about this one? This one is more sustainable. Okay. So I think this debate will continue, but my What's inside the package? That's key. The content always matters. So our value on the packaging side really comes from our ASAP technology, which provides special perishable food up to six months shelf life, without any refrigeration and without any preservatives. And if you can imagine, for example, putting milk in this one and uh, providing it six months shelf life, it's not going to happen. And if you need to provide, I don't know, maybe a month of a shelf life, then you need to refrigerate it, which really is going to increase your carbon footprint. But anyway, that's not my topic today. That was just a teaser say, survey. Uh, what I want to talk about is the first tetra pack. I mean, we, our uh, impact in the industry goes way beyond our packaging. We have also a very strong processing side. Right? And that's what I want to show to you today a bit. But also, of course, we have a global presence. Uh, we are in more than 160 countries uh, with almost 24,000 talented employees. And we have 100,000, more than 100,000 processing lines. Uh, in those countries that are contributing to uh, our customers' solutions that they offer to the market that provide a variety of food to consumers based on their choice. Uh, annually, we manufacture almost uh, 200 billion packages, and we also working with partners manage to recycle a third of it, and we are trying to expand our solutions. Okay, yeah, let me continue this one. So, with our recycling partners, uh, we are recycling almost one third of our packages and we are trying to increase that solution. But as I said, what is important is what's in those packages. So, 
Our, uh, our goal is really, you know, to make food safe and available everywhere. And we want to do this by protecting the people, uh, the food, and the planet. That's our mission. And if you have such a mission, and if you want to really live with your mission, then you need to also work the broader issues in the world. To the next one, and try to solve some of the challenges in the world. And I think the presentations before me, especially from uh, the uh, school, was really interesting. They provide lots of data. Uh, the Lotus Valley International School, I believe. Yeah. I mean, so their data was really compelling. So that's not why I'm going to go through the data here. But what I want to say is, given that you know, the world population is going to increase to 50 billion, uh, so 10 billion by 2050, and that population is going to need 70% more food. We really need to find solutions and transform the industry because the way today we cultivate, we produce, we consume, we transport food is not sustainable. And that's why our solutions will be contributing to a more sustainable future. So I, this is also important because this data shows that actually the food systems transformation uh, provided some solutions to the existing, you know, uh, part that the existing world that we are living in. So, so far with the growing population, if you consider the world growing to more than 7 billion population, there is only 10% people who cannot access to food, which is kind of a good solution, but that solution or that impact came with a significant environmental, societal and economic negative impact. So, if you think of the world food systems economy, currently it's $10 trillion. The food system is creating $10 trillion of economy. But that comes with the expense of $6.6 .6 trillion health issues, $3.2 trillion environmental issues, and $2.1 trillion economic issues. So the net value of food systems today is actually negative. It's $1.9 trillion. And we need to solve that, because economically, this doesn't make sense. So how are we going to contribute to that? So before that, yeah, this was the economic impact of it. And then there is the negative impact side as well. So if you check you know, the impact of food systems today, 26% of greenhouse gas emissions come from food systems, from agriculture. 50% of world's habitable land and 70% of fresh water usage is for agriculture. If you look into the you know, bird and uh, animal biomass, uh, more than 75-80% in compound is used for food. So that's the environmental impact. And uh, we are proposing a solution in our own industry uh, in four different ways. So we have, if you go to the next one, here, four pathways that we're offering. So the first one is, as an important player in the dairy industry, we want to provide solutions that will transform the dairy industry to a more sustainable one. This also acknowledges the importance of dairy as a nutritious you know, food that we can provide to people. But at the same time, uh, it provides livelihood to many small people homes and to many you know, people. In the so we want to create solutions that will transform the daily industry to a sustainable. The second one is, I talked about world population going up almost 10 billion, uh, which will require 70% more food. We want to also increase the diversity of food offering that we are that is in the market. And we want to offer that by providing alternative food, uh, alternative food supplies, and especially on the proteins, like alternative proteins. So I will give a couple of examples on this one. The third one is about reducing food loss and waste. And we talked about one third of food being lost or wasted, and within that, a significant portion, almost 27%, uh, comes from the project production side, even before the food makes it, you know, to the consumer. And then a much more significant 73% comes from the consumption side. And our solutions, especially the aseptic technology, can help on both sides. Because as I said, the aseptic technology is providing a solution that can keep perishable food on the shelf without refrigeration up to six months. And it does it also without any additional preservatives. So it's helping on both sides. And then with our alternative offerings, alternative closures, packaging sizes, we can help the consumers to consume how much they want to consume. And this will also help the, uh, reducing the food waste side. The last one is uh, about scaling access to nutrition with our packaging solutions. And uh, I just talked about it. I mean, this ASAP technology is going to help also providing nutritious food. And with those four pathways, we will be also committing to certain actions at COP28 in our, uh, actually, within this month, basically. So a couple of examples. First of all, I mean, uh, this is a 
this is a big journey that we want to take, and we know that we cannot just, you know, ourselves uh, solve this problem. So we we are working with special startups and utilizing their you know, know-how, their innovation, and combining that with our scale, with our global presence, and with our technology and innovation, so that we can bring solutions together to the market. But ultimately, we have multiple solutions that we are offering to our own uh, company and to those startup collaborations. So the first one is what we call the dairy hub model. On the dairy hub model, we are working with the smallholder farmers, the dairy farmers, uh, we know that you know they are the heart of our industry, and we are educating, providing them trainings, and providing them uh, financial services, and also especially connecting them to our daily processing customers, so that they have a safe way to sell their products, and our daily pro uh, producers have quality milk that's coming to them uh, in a guaranteed you know supply. So with that model, so far around the world, we have. Uh, train more than or reach to more than 68,000 dairy smallholder farmers and pro uh, and connected them to our dairy hubs and to our customers. So with that model, for example, in Bangladesh, we have a dairy hub model. Uh, and with that dairy hub, we managed to increase the income levels of those smallholder farmers up to uh, 50%. And also their yield per cow up to 55%. <coughs> okay, so examples from startups. So with Yalte, we are testing the functionality of hemp seed uh, based drinks. Then with uh, Mysorena, we are working to build a greenfield production facility for fungi fermentation. And then with new caps, we are working on an encapsulation solution that's going to provide a longer uh, shelf life and a, and a better taste for those uh, food supplements. Next one. Then uh, with uh, Swedish startup Enzyme, we are also working to uh, convert the whey from cheese production to a more valued ingredient. And also we are working with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, working on the brewery spent grain, which is a you know, side stream of uh, the brewery industry, to convert that also to another ingredient that can be used as fiber or uh, that can be used as a supplement to other you know, food products. Next one. And then uh, on the education side, maybe that's more relevant to you know the discussions previously. We are working with you know uh, governments, with UN, with uh, international donor organizations uh, to pro to support school feeding programs in the countries. And just in 2022, uh, the Tetra Pak milk packages or alternative you know drink packages provided milk to 66 million children in more than 44 countries around the world. And these programs have been supported by us uh, since 1962. Yeah, last but not least, I really would like to thank you, you know, for uh, listening to me. Uh, and also, we'll be looking forward for further you know, discussions with you on this topic, as we will be here uh, for after this program. And also, you know, uh, we'll be, I'll be staying in your India together with my team till 7th of uh, you know, uh, November. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ferru, and uh, also thank you for your cooperation in adjusting the duration of your presentation, as uh, our uh, chief guest uh, has uh, other commitments. So we will be calling uh, him on stage immediately after this next presentation, this very short presentation on food and nutritional security in India. I would like to request Dr. Anjali Ganpule to kindly come forward. She will also be sharing some information on one of the action labs, which is policy and institutions. Over to Dr. Anjali. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I belong to the nutrition field. I'm trained in doing research related to food system assessment. Uh, Iman, I'm a Imana fellow, and I'm currently working at uh, CCD, CPHFI, New Delhi on food system related projects. Uh, so I'm going to talk about food and nutrition security in uh, India. Next slide, please. Uh, we can see two facts or related to India, related to nutrition, we have been, which have been there on media. On one hand, uh, we are the largest producer of dairy. We are the second largest producer of fruits, vegetables, and greens. And on other hand, uh, it shows that 
glo on global hunger index calculation, we are ranking 111th, which is much lower than our neighborhood countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we know the nutrition situation there, so it is difficult to believe these facts. So we need to know more about how this index is calculated. If we look at the calculation that has been followed for measuring this global hunger index, it is based on four indicators. The first three are related to under five children, related to their stunting, vesting and mortality. Now the issue with this index is that the reference from the WHO growth chart which they are using is published two decades back. And we are not aware whether this is contextualized to Indian context. The second, which is the food undernutrition, which is measured using the FIA scale by FAO, it is a food security experience scale, which is an eight-point scale on basis of this undernutrition condition is measured. So I can show you two studies which are from India. Uh, the first study is uh, done recently, published recently in 2023. It is done by very senior researchers related to pediatric spirit and physiology spirit. And what they tried to do is take evidence from 10,000 under five children and contextualize the prevalence of stunting and vesting in Indian context. And what they can find that if we use the Indian standards, the prevalence of stunting and vesting which is presented will come reduced by 50%. The second study is from my own group. Uh, we did it at CCDC. It was a chef study, which is a sustainable, healthy, environment food system study. It was funded by Welcome Trust, and it was done parallelly in India, Africa, and UK. Uh, the teams from uh, London School of Hygiene and the chef's team has been monitoring this study continuously for the past three years. They have been partners with us. So this study was done among 9,005 adults, among male, female, from rural and urban continent from Vishakhapattinam and Sonipat. Uh, we measured the food insecurity using the same scale that has been used by FAO, which is used by EON, and we followed the analysis methodology in the same way. And the whole process has been monitored and reviewed thoroughly. If we go to the next slide, we can see these are the eight questions that are asked. We can see that it shows severe, moderate, and mild food insecurity. And only less than 3% of the population out of 9,005 had severe food insecurity which was reported. So it is not something like 20% or 28%, it is less than 3%. Though it is less than 3%, we cannot ignore that. But we can see the contrasting situation. We not only use this tool, but we also validated these results because only numbers cannot help to make the policies or help the public health professionals. So we use another tool which is a diet diversity measurement school uh, uh, which is validated and used by FAO and the methodology is published which shows how many food groups people are consuming. So out of the nine food groups we can see in both Sonipat and Vishakhapatana in rural and urban around 90% of the people consumed at least four food groups which are starchy staples, other fruits and vegetables, dairy, and the fourth group was coming from either legumes and leafy vegetables. So we can see people are not inadequate in relation to having food, but we can also see that there is a nutritional insecurity. As the foods which are higher in nutrient or micronutrients are consumed lesser. So based on this evidence, we can see that if we use Indian evidence and contextualize it to Indian data set, our hunger index will be much lower. But to say this, we need uh, we need state level monitoring using the validated tool that can allow us global comparison. And we cannot just rely on one tool. We need to know which foods are lacking, where they are lacking. We need to identify the hotspots and take action. So we need the representative sample from India, which will go to district village level and every state-wise report which needs to be generated every year. These tools are not very difficult to 
administer and there is a methodology available but we cannot challenge what is published unless we have our own abilities. And we also need consumer because food is available, it is not reaching people. So one thing we can see is access is not there or people are not aware what to consume or they are not having foods which are rich in micronutrients. So we need consumer awareness campaigns and we need definitely to understand the food systems and the local solutions. The solutions provided by some other country are not going to help us to make policy decisions or public health actions because we have different issues. So these are the things which are coming up from uh, research from my group and thank you. So I want to thank funding agencies, participants and I want to thank Pavan Sir Food Future Foundation for giving me this opportunity. It really took us long to you know, get this report published because our data was showing something different than what is shown internationally. So they really cross-checked our data multiple times. It took us two years to publish this data. But I'm happy that I could get a chance to share. Thank you, Dr. Anjali, for coming all the way from Pune. And uh, that brings us uh, to our award uh, distribution, which will be done by the hands of uh, our Chief Guest Sri Indivar Pandey, sir. This is uh, the Food Future Foundation Annual Award. Uh, these are the annual awards uh, that are uh, distributed by Food Future Foundation. And uh, every year, it happens on our Foundation Day, which also happens to be the World Food Day. 16th of October. This year, we celebrated our Foundation Day virtually. So, we did announce these awards, but we have uh, our uh, award winners here with us who are waiting to collect them in person. So, may I please request you to do the honors. I request uh, Sri Indivar Pandey sir and Pavan sir to be here on stage with us to distribute these uh, awards to our winners. And I would like to invite on stage our Winner, co-founder of Arne's Fit Kids and advisor at Food Future Foundation, Ms. Aditi Mehrotra. <laughs> Recognizing the dedication and contribution to public health and nutrition through Arne's Fit Kids for the nutritional betterment of children and her revolutionary endeavors to amplify food literacy and propagate sustainable food practices. Thank you so much. Ms. Aditi. And we would like to invite for the second award uh, from Lotus Valley International School uh, Vice Principal Ms. Ritu Java. <laughs> Recognizing the school's commitment to making food literacy an integral part of every student's journey and uh, for the exemplary display of this curriculum at the prestigious National Food Coalition Workshop on 5th and 6th October 2023. This is to acknowledge the pioneering efforts in community leadership and global inspiration saluting the great effort of uh, Lotus Valley International School Gurugram. Can we clap for them? Congratulations to both our winners. School children are not doing something for themselves. They are doing for the nation and maybe for the globe. You know, I think the curriculum that we are preparing, that we are developing with your help, will really make a change the way the world needs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, they have done uh, a lot to win the award. We can at least uh, put our hands together and uh, show them on. Uh, yes, thank you. And I request our chief guest, uh, Sri Indivar Pandey, sir, to please address the gathering.
A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here in this, uh, in this uh, meeting. And uh, I'm really happy to present our side of the story. What is being happening, what is happening on the policy forefront as far as the nutrition is concerned, food security is concerned. And what changes we have brought in the last few years, particularly. Uh, you are all aware that we have a population of 1.4 billion out of which women and children comprise 68% of the population. And these are our target group. These are the people who will be from the Ministry of Women and Child Development and Women. And nutrition again is one of our core mandates for everyone. It's not only for women and children. We run world's largest nutrition program where we are giving supplementary nutrition to 1.4 million Anambadi centers spread across length and breadth of the country, right from uh, Andaman, Nicobar to Ladakh and from uh, Bhuj to extreme and in northeast. So we have 1.4 million Anambadi centers to whom we provide nutrition to children up to the age of six years, pregnant women and lactating mothers, and also uh, adolescent girls in the age group 14 to 18 years. If you see, the program started way back in 1975, and for roughly 43 years, it was like a feeding program, where we are just concerned with the input. Yes, the children are coming to the Anandwadi Center, we are giving them food, somewhere dalia, somewhere rice and dal, and whatever format, depending on the local conditions we are here. Uh, in 2018, Honorable Prime Minister launched the Poshan Abhiyan, and I would say that has been a game changer in the entire thing. Let me tell you, even though we were giving the supplementary nutrition, what is the outcome for this supplementary nutrition was not known to anybody. The Anandwari worker used to have 11 registers in which she will, she will dutifully note down the names and details of all the children, but she did not have anything with her through which she can identify whether a child is fit, child is obese, or child is under weight, or severely malnutrition. Honorable Prime Minister talks of uh, giving the growth monitoring devices in all the Anandwari. Uh, within two years, we had the growth monitoring devices in all the Anandwari. We also focus very heavily on technology as a governance tool. And the ministry was told to come out with something so that we can use the existing uh, technical system or provide it to Anandwadi workers so that we can measure each and every child. So first we gave the growth monitoring devices, parallelly we gave them a mobile phone. So all 1.4 million Anandwadis have a mobile phone with them. And the technical underpinning for which is our portal called Potion Tracker. Potion Tracker uh, gives a, I mean, comprehensive tool to the Anganwadi worker, to which we, as of today, I can see the status of each and every child who goes to Anganwadi sitting at my desk in Delhi. And this 1.4 million Anganwadi is scattered to, as of now, 10.3 uh, crore, which is 103 million children, adolescent girls, and pregnant women and lactating mothers. So this is the scale of operations. Now what we do, we have you know, unique identifier called Aadhaar in our system. So every child's Aadhaar, mother's Aadhaar is fed in our system. We have their date of birth. We weigh them regularly every month. We weigh them, we measure their length or height depending on the age group and we enter it. So and we have also put in our uh, this WHO growth charts as part of the system. So the moment you put, put in all these data, a graph will show up in the Anandwadi workers, this thing, in the portal. And it will show that the, whether the child is obese, or he or she is normal, or he or she is suffering from severe malnutrition. Uh, for reference, let me tell you, last five months from April onwards, we have been measuring on an average 6.8 crore children. Last month, we measured 7.2 crore children, which is 72 million children we did it. And the data shows that uh, extent of malnutrition is 
6.8%. These are consistent across the country. There are variations. Good uh, states are showing good results, and uh, depending on the how the scheme is being implemented. But that that comes to less than 7%. And what is called severely acutely malnutrition, that uh, uh, the percentage comes to around 2%. So now, if you see similarly, when we talk of surveys, National Family Health Survey uh, 5 throws up a figure of 19.3% of the children are malnutrition. There are our survey which is based on monthly monitoring on every month without fail, and where we have trained our Anandwadi workers for measurements through World Bank, through doctors. I mean, we have an entire ecosystem of training and ensuring that they are doing it properly. We have no interest in showing good or bad results because it shows that stunting is slightly higher than what NFHS shows. But the fact is that these children who are coming from the poorest of the poorest strata, and those figures are exactly one third of what NFHS shows. So you say these are the data based on which our rankings in hunger index at times is counted. Because if you see two thirds of the weightage goes to the children unrelated data. And they are also, in spite of we telling them very clearly, this is what we have found, and this is based on the this thing. They, the foundation did not agree to our findings, and they stuck by this thing. Now, I don't know how can somebody say that India has more prevalence of undernourishment when we supply food to all our neighbors, and you had food riots in Pakistan some time back. I mean, people were running after the trucks carrying the uh, ATA. Those kind of things we have seen with our own eyes. And we are talking about India being 100 odd. Our assessment is India's rank should be somewhere between 40 to 48 in that. And the rate at which we are reducing our uh, levels of malnutrition, let me assure you, you will see that by 2030, when we talk of SDG goals, we'll be, we'll be definitely much below. But. Uh, let me also tell you that this kind of uh, bright future which I am projecting, I was probably the most cynical when I got posted to this department two and a half years back. The things were there, but somehow the software was not working. It is, and then when it started working, the Anandwadi workers were not very really keen on this thing. They said, you have this problem, you have this problem. So we worked with them. We identified what are the things they require. Because finally it is they in the field, if their work becomes easier, they'll be happily adopting it. Over a period of one year, we have n number of conferences with them. We went to field with our software people also. And we went to every state. And let me tell you, in the last three months, I've been to Kerala, I've been to GNK, I've been to Northeast. And the first thing I go there and ask the Anandwadi worker, I'm happy with the, this thing, are there any issues? And without exception, they have said, there are no issues with Ocean Tracker now, it's working very well. So, I think the biggest credit, I'll, I'll give it to our Prime Minister, who had this vision, unless you can measure something, you cannot find a solution to it. And now that we, are, we have started measuring, we are getting the extent of the problem in every area. We can identify each and every child, girl, boy, uh, with uh, definite uh, this thing. Then we are taking up those cases and how to solve that, we have the systems. It's not that key. we did not know how to bring a child from uh, severely, acutely malnourished to the normal. So there are laid down protocols. Just 15 days back, we have we have had a joint protocol issuance with the Department of Health, and which has been sent to all the states, where for the SAM children who need hospitalization, we have laid down a detailed protocol. What will Anganwadi worker do? What will the ASHA worker do? What will ANN do? And it has been everything laid down in black and white, and how the child will go to nutrition center, how we will support their family. Because when the child goes to NRC, you need, they, the parents will not be able to learn if they are, say, wage laborers. So we provide them uh, money during that period so that they can stay with the child. With this kind of uh, work which we have done, I can say now with confidence, we are very sure that over the next few years, you will see all this talk of malnutrition going, and a lot of people who are in this business of projecting India as the, I mean, malnutrition capital of the world. In one of the ads we saw, one of the very renowned uh, NGOs of the country, they have put a very, I mean, a child used as if he is almost, he or she is almost dying. Then we issue the notice on what basis you are asking for uh, donation from this. 
Our scheme is 100% saturation, universal scheme. You also can walk in if you are a if your child is a beneficiary, you have a right to go there and ask for the uh, things you get from the Anganwadi system. So when there is a universal scheme which gives for food security, and then you talk of that people are dying of hunger and people are dying of malnutrition, this is beyond us. Let me tell you on record, not even one case of death due to hunger has been reported by any of the states. Though I mean people will have their different views. People, in the end, children die of other diseases. Wash is also one of the main things. Now, two, three things I, I want to the notice of everyone present here because you are the, I mean, uh, chain makers in true sense. One of the areas where a lot of work needs to be done is complementary feeding between six months to two years. Now, zero to six is zero uh, months to six months is the child has to be, I mean, only given breast milk. It's only when the mother is not able to feed, then you have other options. But six months to two years, complementary feeding is required. Across the country, our study shows that only 11% of children in that age group are getting the adequate food for, for what they need. And this is here, the mothers have a big role to play, civil society has a big role to play. It's beyond government tackling at that level six months to two years. Because, and it's not rural urban divide, the, the ratios are same for rich and poor, rural and urban. So even we don't know how much we have to feed our children. I mean, in our case, probably our grandchildren. So that is something which uh, I request all of you. The study shows that a two-year child needs 50% of the food of an adult man, human being. Do we, are we giving that much of food uh, to them? I think all of us. Somehow or other, if the, uh, if the mothers are working, they have a problem, they need someone. And handling uh, kids at that age is also very difficult. Feeding them is not an easy job. It's very difficult. They'll keep running from here to there and getting to eat is a major challenge. But this is one area where we need to do a lot of work. And that work is every, every one of us, we have to uh, take this to the uh, new mothers and all the families that this is one area where we are really having a problem. Rest of the things, I think we are on track. One of the, some of the changes which we have made in last two, three years are phenomenal, like fortified rice. Now we are giving across the country fortified rice, which also has, apart from B12, iron and folic acid, which, I mean, micronutrients are going through this. This will help in a big way in controlling the anemia in women in particular. We are giving millets in the supplementary nutrition across the country. We are running uh, Potion Ma and Potion Ma we have in September and we have Potion Pakpara in March. These are basically Jan Andolan activities in which we propagate the themes, what are uh, what we need to take to the grassroots level. Some of the things like uh, in what I talked about, infant and young child feeding norms for the zero to two years children. Then uh, diet diversity is something very, very important for us because if you see, and local food. I mean, if something is grown in Maharashtra in summer, definitely that particular food is good for people of that area, in that particular weather. So the, the, the concept of exotic food, we, we in peak summer, if we eat something which grows in winter, there's something wrong there. And that we have to look at those issues also. We also have a lot of, now, nutri gardens in Anganwadi, nearly 6.3 lakh Anganwadis have the nutri gardens. <coughs> In the NFSA rules, we have notified. Till now, our focus used to be only on calorie and uh, proteins. We have only specified calorie and protein till last year. Now, what used to happen when you give calorie, how you give the calorie? You will not believe across the country, all the states were giving major portion of calorie in the form of sugar. So we were preparing, preparing a generation of children who become diabetic at an early age. Now that... In one of the states, the extent of calorie through sugar was 43%. And here, FSSAI has a big role to play. FSSAI, in fact, has commissioned a study with the World Food Program. They had they had shared the findings with us. And then from 43% of calorie going in form, form of sugar to the young children. Whereas WHO norm is 9%. There was no micronutrients. Now micronutrients have been added. And NIN prepares the food basket or how the dietary composition which is to be given to the children for this. This we have ensured that all this is provided to the 
children in that, that was the new NFSA norms. The other things about uh, hunger index, I think uh, she spoke very well about hunger index. I don't have to say anything, but you all know ki how it has been calculated and what are the issues. We just like to assure everybody that government is committed to ensure that all the children or women who are, whether they are coming to Anganwadi or not, there are two ways. Those who are coming to Anganwadi, we have a different system, but those who are outside, they have to be taken care of, portion of the through the outreach. And here, what you have done as a school, as a curriculum for nutrition is something very important. We hear a lot about nutrition, but to put it in black and white and simple language and to explain to the children is a big task. If you can convince the children they are our investor, they, the next generation is saved. So to that extent, I'll, 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 I'm really thankful to the organization today and also Lotus Valley and others who have made this uh, kind of curriculum for nutrition. This will be a great uh, beginning for the control of malnutrition across the spectrum. Because rich people have different problems and those problems of obesity are no better than what you see with the stunting or wasting levels. So they also need to be handled in a similar way and they should be aware what to eat and what not to eat. Children, in that case, schools play a key role. We talk of nutrition as one point and then our, our uh, canteens in the schools will give samosa and all kinds of samosa, burger and all kinds of unhealthy food is given in the schools. So probably schools, if they, if they come along and they also realize that they have a major role to play in this, you'll see that food scenario in the country is changing and nutrition scenario in the country is changing in a big way. I'm very happy for the uh, start of this coalition. I'd, I'd like to personally thank Sri Pamela Kual sir and his team for organizing this conference and taking it in an area where nobody has worked till now. So hopefully these things will, over a period of time, stabilize and we'll have children who are well versed in nutrition and then they can tell their mothers also to what to eat, to eat and what not to eat. Thank you. Jai. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, appreciation, for your involvement, and uh, for uh, sharing such diverse information with us today. And especially the thing that you told us about uh, kids from six months to two years is worth noting and learning from. Uh, we are very, very thankful to you for being here with us today.